Yes. Okay. So I'm going to start off with thanking you for having us here and putting the NCD on the agenda. So one of the things that we learned is keeping the energy bears like an energy source. So, and it's getting to be that holiday season. So let's keep some candy going around, get that energy level going, um, get some of the extra calories like bears getting into their dens, trying to get those last ones denned up. So you have two handouts in front of you. Um, so after last year's fall, meeting at this time we were asked to go back and validate our five-year plan we talked about that yesterday we submitted our draft plan as asked last january we revisited at our subcommittee meeting in the spring and i pulled out what we approved in the spring we have the formal plan in front of you just for 2015 it's the same outline for each year in our five-year plan um, I'll follow Mary's example of not reading it to you, but I wanted to show a few slides from the highlight of our meeting that we had last week. And I have in the audience several folks that will help make sure that I don't say anything wrong because I am not the scientist or the biologist expert that many support the NCDE are. And so Cecily, Lori, Chris, and others are going to step in if I were to misrepresent anything. So we're going to talk about some of the demographics and the results. Just uh, reviewing where we had the trend capture zones. It started from the um, density as re reported out by Kate Kendall from the USGS and the DNA study. So this was the trend capture zones of what our target is that we're trying to have collar out there on the landscape within the NCD. I don't know where to stand, so not many ones away. So this year in 2015, the number of individuals captured, um, and you can see the different types of how they were captured. 43 were captured, 43 individuals of the total 45 captures. This has both the research and the augmentation and the management. shows where the captures occurred. One of the questions that people would come up and Wayne alluded in it with the cabin of Yak is every time um, Eric Wenham was set to go out, we had stock ready, we had locations ready, and we had fires. And so we'd have another trail closure, we'd have another areas that we needed to um, re reroute folks. And so you see that we didn't have captures and trend um, updates occur and a good share of the bob because of uh, the fire season that we have. This is the fate of the radio research bears in 2015. So you see that um, 25 females were alive and went into the den, three males. We have unresolved two collar, collar failures that they're still working on, one dead female. So we have a total of 33 females and five males. There's the fate of the radio management bears. Everyone can see okay? You need to go through. So talking about mortality, it's always very interesting between ecosystems, what's trending, what's going on. Big picture look for NCDE from 1971 to 2015. Um, you can see where the hunting season ended then. Um, and look at the total mortality in, in view of the bigger picture. Um, we had a poor food source in 2015, but you can see that it wasn't as expected. Um, we weren't at a high mortality, as high as some years have been. Again, looking at whether the causes of the mortality from 2004 to 2015, um, the removals, the human caused, and the natural or the undetermined. Um, so here's breaking down the human caused, where we have um, defense of property for DOP, defense of livestock, poached, mistaken, orphan, capture mortality, train and auto. Kind of a contrast. Then it's defense of life, not livestock. Oh, defense of life. 
See, I told you they were going to correct me. And, uh, well, it's like, that's just kind of a thing. <laughs> that's a good one. Defense of life. Where the person playing defense of life. Yeah. Thank you. All right, so 2015, a lot of discussion about um, our ecosystem. Six grizzly bears killed by autos and collisions on the road systems and the highways. So this was a big discussion point for us at our meeting. And I um, don't know if anyone wants to add any of those details for folks, but just be aware it's, it's not a usual trend we have that many hit by autos. And a lot of times the discussions have been by train. This year it's strictly autos. Agency removals um, gives you an idea the different contrasts that have occurred. So looking at this year in particular, we have the livestock depredation, property damage, and then the augmentation. So as Wayne shared, the one that male that was removed from the uh, Whitefish North Fork area for augmentation also then ended up being um, removed from the population. So it counted as a mortality for this ecosystem. This is just an idea of where the mortalities occurred, just to give you that bigger picture. Ownership of where the mortalities occurred. And then moving into the presentation, you guys saw a good share of this this summer, so this is very abbreviated. Um, as Rick Mace was moving on and Cecily has moved in, her updated results and sharing information with us. And she's got a great team of folks that are helping um, move things forward. So as we view our draft conservation plan, these are the monitoring that's in place and uh, trying to move forward here. The blue area represents the recovery line from 1993. This shows you that all of our fair management units met occupancy criteria from 2010 to 2014. And the different colors rep represent the years that were occupied. Just the bear distribution from 92 to 2002. And you can compare it to 2004 to 2014. Moving on into reproductive rates. Um, a lot of you have paid a lot of attention to what Rick Mace had published and looked at in the past and then the current analysis um, and the sample size change putting all the bears into it for some good reasons. And we're still seeing the similar results. One of the things that um, did a great job in sharing with all of us is that what we really know is the agency removals and the radio mark deaths, they're well documented, you know, so you, have, you really know that part of the equation. Other deaths must be discovered, reported, so you have a high frequency of reporting when you have automobile, train, defensive life, defensive property, mistaken ID, and then low reporting with your poaching, natural, undetermined. This is a sample calculation that Cecily went through with us of how things that when you know how it gets estimated with all the science brought into it. Just uh, showing you the increase. So we have a two to three percent increase per year. And then the causes of death from 2004 to 2014, seeing the estimated proportions um, applied there from the radio marked and research bears. So in summary, the, the primary conservation area is fully occupied by reproductive females since 2009. 
The distribution has increased approximately 58% since 2002 and extends beyond the demographic area. No negative trends in the vital rates were observed. They were consistent with the population growth of approximately estimated 2.3%. Assuming the population size of 765 bears in 2004, based on a study from Kate Kendall and all, um, the 2014 estimates 960 bears, and you can see the confidence interval. And we've increased two to three percent per year. Any questions on these summaries that you guys would like to have answered before I go on? Yeah, what's the last word that got cut off on the bottom? Yeah. <laughs> Delisting. Delisting. Decline. Decline. And next time I will have Lori and Cecily do the presentation. <laughs> We're recommending to them that they do it more for the expertise they can provide. But as you've heard it before, I wanted to make sure we just went through the basic numbers here. So I wanted to just share a, a snapshot of some of the bear management specialists who were fortunate in NCD to have a wide range of experts out there. And I want to bring attention to issues that got brought up um, that we haven't put as much thought into. Mike Madel is bringing up the calf keep, creep feeder issue that are coming out as bears are expanding, and so we think about the Rocky Mountain front and how far out they're going. Um, corn and the corn fields are becoming a very big deal, and so most of us don't think about the agricultural impacts. Um, chickens was not a big topic this year, but if we can't let chickens fall off the screen because they will continue to be with our, in our communities and around. It was suggested to us that we recommend everyone not be allowed to have chickens. That's not within the purview of our subcommittee nor order we want to tackle that issue. Um, I got a few pictures from Tim Manley and from Mike Madel. Two of our bear management specialists just showing you once we do have habituation that uh, you have a lot of things that can happen. I just put this up because we were reminded again by the professionalism and the skill and dedication how much the caring goes into the animals that are handled both from management to research and from conflict and how much it means to the landowners or the um, occupants to be engaged and involved and, and meet and see those bears, um, what that means when they're included in hands-on discussions and on-site. So like when we have a bear that comes to the ranger station for relocation, if we get to send somebody out and having them help or be in the vehicle as they observe that relocation or um, as one of the bear management specialists has a landowner engaged in, um, whether it's with the release or with the drugging handling and loading of air, it really makes a difference of future outcomes. Would it break to do that? just the repeated attempts for a bear to continue to try to test a shed. So this was a bear that had successfully gotten attractants. And so she had two um, yearlings or sub-adults sub with her. Also repeating and estimating her actions of repeated there. Here you have a female and a cub checking out a trap. Tim then had a video that went with this one that showed the female getting caught in the the other sub-adult 
standing outside the trap, and then they've got the dilemma of how to deal with the next capture. Um, just a couple things from uh, Mike Mayo on the Rocky Mountain front. So we have very different issues around the whole NCDE. Just a reminder that you know we've got a lot more community, um, isolated wooded, forested issues going on on the west side. We've got the corn on the tribe, Salish Kootenai tribe, the, the grain. We've got a lot of livestock issues going on, property damage, the um, hunting encounters, beehive crop foraging incidents. Personally, I found the digging of the bears with the electric fencing, trying to fence the grain silos, and traditionally the folks storing the grain haven't worried if you had some spillage going out. They're finding that some of the doors on this on the grain storage are not bear resistant. So one of the things that's going to be tackled in the future is we have more bears out on the prairie. Um, they're climbing, they're getting in, they're busting doors off. Um, something that's going to have to be tackled. Lots of home landowner, homeowner contacts. Um, while we have the bear fairs going on, lots of articles, it was re reiterated by Greg yesterday, those one-on-one -on -one contacts continue to be very successful for all of us. One of the things that happens um, both on the Rocky Mountain front and on the southern end is a lot of the carcass redistribution that goes on for success. They had lower numbers of carcass that needed to be removed this last winter. And so people were worried where there was going to be an adequate spring source where people, where bears were regularly expecting them to be at. Other things that uh, the fencing and the partnerships that we have, this is a new propane gun shooter that uh, we were told how effective it was being in certain cases. So the more tools and tips we can give to these folks to be successful, um, the better off they are in making sure we don't have mortalities occur. We also had presentations and a lot of ongoing research going on. Um, Tabitha Graves with the USGS is up engaged with the NCD, the Trubrin report moving ahead with family tree and a huckleberry pilot and then fishwife and parks and cooperation with msu is looking at some electric fencing issues this has some bear installers in montana we went to as i understand it, there's going to be some three stand strand electric fencing that's going to be now for border fencing and property particularly out on the rocky mountain front well we have the electric fence standards that IGBC had approved at the seven strand or the mesh. And so as we have landowners moving to this three strand for other purposes, how is that going to work or be in cooperation, you know, thinking about the bigger picture of our partners and the landowners out there. So as we look forward to 2016, you guys have a work plan for 2016. We um, will be continuing with our progress on moving the draft conservation plan ahead. One of the big steps occurring is we have five national forests that have a draft environmental impact statement coming out with bringing habitat standards forward. That is expected in March of 2016 to be um, released and available for public comment. If you're needing more information on that, please check the Flathead Forest webpage and that will be releasing the document for all of the forests involved with that. Um, the other um, land management agencies are going to be reporting out again at our spring meeting on their progress to bringing forward the habitat pro um, standards into like the park has a compendium that will be updated. We're checking to see where Rick, I need to talk with you more. We are, we're now short of BLM representation. We've tried, but we've kind of failed with retirements and moving. So we missed BLM on our last subcommittee meeting. We are also really striving to keep our interagency coordination alive and well. It's done well, and we're really pleased with that. 
We have some outstanding partner groups and landowners are stepping forward. Education information, having that response and presence. We're really having a lot of discussions about linkages and the connectivity. We will continue to work with the cabinet yet to address some of the questions and things there. But it's beyond that and I'll carry forward with that in just a minute. We are also trying to get our counties or communities a little bit more engaged. We do not have a county rep or multiple reps on our subcommittee. They, there never has been. So we've um, had the agencies and the tribe, tribes, and we're trying to work forward to the county representation and there's some community more engagement there. I also want to introduce Jim Williams. So in the spring, April-ish, um, Jim will be transitioning into the chair of the NCDE, and he just wanted to mention just a couple things that are important to him with the linkages and connectivity. All right, thanks, Deb. And I want to, in part, address a little bit the interest from the Cabinet GAC sub subcommittee. I used to sit on that and the interest in linkage with the NCDE. But first, I want to share some good news. Uh, tomorrow, our commission meets. We have a governor's appointed commission like other states. And from a habitat update, and this deals with linkage a little bit, also the NCDE, we have uh, two huge conservation easements that are being considered and discussed by our commission. One, and they're in the South Whitefish Range. And my counterparts in BC, they work for Tony, would call it the East Kootenays. We call it the Whitefish Range. But it's the southern face right out of Whitefish. We have a conservation easement on Haskell Creek, which is the water supply for the city of Whitefish, and we have a conservation easement proposed in Trumbull Creek. Both of those are Stoltz family forest lands, kind of similar to Dark Woods or our Montana Legacy project that we've done with uh, corporate timberland owners in the past. That's super good news. Uh, they cost millions of dollars each in each case, and they're both couched as part of our Habitat Montana program. And many members in here are partners. Uh, Jody's back there, uh, they do HCPs, we use those money to garner, garner match, the Forest Legacy dollars. So that's exciting. We're also talking about uh, with Plum Creek, and there's a big change on the horizon, you've probably seen it. They're gonna roll over warehouse or purchase Plum Creek. They're gonna become warehouse timber. And uh, Chris and Wayne mentioned linkage and the old linkage review. We identified Swift and Lazy Creek. We're in discussions, and that's just north, north of Whitefish. It's a big block of about, oh, 20 sections of land surrounded by state lands. It's in a critical linkage area from the NCD toward the Cabin Yak, and, and for a host of other species too, beyond grizzly bears. But um, we're in negotiations with the Trust for Public Lands, TPL, and Plum Creek. Uh, it's, a, it's a big price tag, but the we're pretty excited the negotiations have started. So we're looking at linkage conservation there. And uh, we're in Missoula. I want to take a moment. I know the staff here, Mike Thompson, the wildlife manager, and Randy Arnold, the Sioux, they were looking at the remaining Plum Creek plants that are left down here. They're in discussions with their county commissioners. And we need to get our county commissioners on the north end better involved. And uh, we'll probably talk to Phil or Pam. I think there's interest, but they're spread pretty thin. Uh, Gary's here from the front. We have an ongoing part of our Habitat Montana program. We've done some uh, really big projects for easements and acquisitions on the front, and frankly, a linkage between the Yellowstone and the NCDE. We, uh, Gary Shepard did a huge project through with the wildlife staff, Ken and uh, Rick Northrup. It's called Whitetail Prairie. It's an addition to the Beartooth. That area, the Beartooth game range is right next to the gates of the mountains. That area just happens to sit right between the NCDE and the Yellowstone. So we've got a lot going on on the habitat front front where we're literally spending millions of dollars that impact the NCD in a good way. So I just wanted to share that with the, with the committee. Um, linkage. You know, I've always looked at linkage as kind of four major components. The first one, pretty technical, genetic, you know, genetic assignments, Michael Proctor, Tabitha, Rick, a whole bunch of folks in this room have done uh, published papers on that, you know, gene flow. Are males and females both moving? Are they reproducing? Are they moving forward, going back? Are they dying? Uh, then there's demographic. Frank mentioned that a little bit, I think, uh, in one of the questions. He got demographic linkage. And then there's habitat permeability. And that's where I wanted to uh, signal to everyone here in the NCD, um, I want to engage the group. Warehouse is going to take over Plum Creek. There's a huge ownership between the Cabinet Yak and the NCD that now will be owned by Warehouse. They are a real estate investment trust, just like Plum Creek. So I think there's opportunities to work with them on a cooperative, volunteer-type basis as a private company. 
uh, with a whole bunch of partners to look at maybe some conservation solutions for the Lost Trail area, the Hubbard area. These are all these areas these bears are already moving. It wasn't about, oh, Lori came running into my office a few years ago saying, we got a bear, I think, denned in the Salish. It's up on Elk Mountain. It was a grizzly. We haven't had a grizzly den there since they were probably shot out in, you know, years ago. And sure enough, Tim Thier and I went up there and I got to hike in and we got to the top of Elk Mountain right at the summit and it looked like a, like a billy scraper took off half the hill. And Thier said, there's one. He's worked on bears his whole life. And I, we climbed down and sure enough, there's a den. You could, I can almost stand it up in it. I'm pretty short, but uh, Tim couldn't. But there was a male den. Well, this year, um, Deb and I found out that Tim, Lori, correct me if I'm wrong, we might have a female that will probably come out with cubs just north of where we were, and that sits right in no man's land between recovery areas. So the bears themselves are turning, in, turning into this great big gooey mess of a distribution that really complicates the legal work that we do with recovery areas. But it's good news and it's fascinating. So um, the last linkage issue besides permeability and warehouser, I'm not going to use Plum Creek anymore because it's going to be Warehouser. I think there's a lot of work we can do with our partners. Is uh, tolerance. You know, where do we want bears? Gary's got them going out on the prairie. Do we want them out east of Great Falls on grain farms? I'd probably suggest to you probably not. And you don't want to push society's tolerance there. Uh, some of those areas, they're using the riparian corridors to march east. They're going south. They're going west at a slower rate. But they're, they are moving based on the data that Lori and Cecily will probably be sharing with you in the next few years. Hopefully you can get some more bears marked out there. Um, so tolerance is a big deal. Where do we want bears? And so those four things um, all relate to linkage. We can talk about, love to talk to the committee. And then the last one is the conservation strategy, how we define linkage in there that potentially is subject to litigation if, if metrics aren't followed. And, and linkage is really complicated. I deal with it with BPA fisheries and wildlife and crediting, so we have to be real careful as we put uh, requirements for linkage in any, any document. Who gets the credit when there's multiple money sources and everyone wants credit for a project on the ground? So it's good news, but it's pretty complicated and, and love to have that discussion. So thanks, Dave. Any further questions or comments from the NCD?